What is up, everybody? Welcome to the Amer the American Peloton. Well, of course, I biffed the first time I'm saying the name of the show. I'm Jonathan Crane. I'm a uh, mediocre Cat 2 bike racer out of Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, started doing this YouTube thing during the pandemic when I had nothing else to do. Swift racing a bunch, and uh, that kind of branched out into watching along with a lot of American criteriums and talking a lot of other bike stuff on this channel. And that is now branching out into something else. Uh, been talking a lot of bikes with Ben. Having to figure out what side of me you're on. This is Ben Edwards. He is a uh, coach at Skyway Coaching, which uh, information on that in the description. But Ben's a coach, former collegiate racer. And through that, like me, he's got a lot of connections to um, some of the guys that race currently at a high level domestically right now. Uh, also raced elite mountain bike stuff for a while, but currently the, uh, what do you call yourself? DS, the head head of Skyway Domestique? Team director, yeah. I think that's Team the director. term, yeah. DS, yeah, yeah, director sportif. Um, so that's who we are. This show is the American Peloton, and we are going to talk about American bike racing. There's a lot of people talking a lot of different things uh, on the internet. This show is going to be live on YouTube. We're going to do this first one live. I don't know. Maybe we'll start recording them or something, but it'll be video and it'll also be available on podcast platforms. I know there are some shows that I always watch on YouTube and then others that I like to listen to like when I'm out riding and stuff. So yeah, trying to trying to broaden the horizons of this channel a little bit. And it's kind of Ben's idea to start a podcast. And he had mentioned it. And then we were talking the other day about the National Criterium League, which is what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we were having this lengthy conversation about it because our team, Skyway Domestique, was looking at, you know, what races are we going to do? Is there going to be, is one of these things going to be close to us? Is there even going to be an amateur racing component? Because we're like a elite amateur team, kind of like Cat 2 is kind of what we're aiming for. Um, so yeah, as we're having this conversation about like, what is National Criterium League? It's like, this conversation is the podcast. We need to talk about this because we're, as we're diving into it, there's like no information available. Yeah, it's, it's pretty sparse for whatever reason, um, which you would think something of the magnitude that's being, that's being advertised would be all over. Everyone would be talking about it. They'd be, have articles everywhere. And it just doesn't seem to be the case. Especially like they're making some big, like you said, the magnitude they're talking about, they're making some very big swings, at least in terms of like what they're promising. So this podcast does have a video element. So we're going to play some videos. I'm also just going to describe what's going on in the video. And I think that'll play um, both on uh, video and audio. I am learning how all this stuff works. Video big, me small. Here we go. All right. So the NCL does have a YouTube channel. They've only put three videos on them, one on that channel. One of the videos is less than 10 seconds long. So we're going to go through the videos they have put on there and just talk about what we're seeing. So NCL video number one, we've got uh, it says shifting gears. There's a cassette spinning. We've got uh, some footage of random Grand Fondos and road races, not Criteriums, which National Cycling League is all Criteriums. Uh, looks like a bunch of guys descending just random dudes someone on a spin bike looking into the camera this is my favorite one though just an old flight deck sti shifter being like gently squeezed with the cable coming out there and then uh this guy in tennis shoes and running shoes posting up by himself and red and blue smoke coming together in the middle of the screen with a red and blue logo superimposed over it and it just says, don't blink. So not a lot of info there. Ben, your reaction to that? It just seems like, well, so we do know they're outsourcing a lot of their social media through um, TORI or T, like the acronym is T-O-R-R-E. Um, seems like it's whoever's doing it probably doesn't know a whole lot about bike racing and is sort of just taking B-roll and clips anywhere they can get it. Um, 
it just seems a little weird. Like whoever's putting this together doesn't have a whole lot of base knowledge of cycling or criteriums or at least elite level cycling. We'll get into who is putting it on. I'm going to play this next video and it'll, it'll set up a little bit of the next topic here, but this one is a little bit more in depth, but still, yeah, we'll get into it. It says the MCL raised $7.5 million. They said it couldn't be done. A sports league devoted to equity and diversity, not just in its athletes, but in its owners and investors. But we broke the cycle. We've been at the forefront before. This time, we want to own Got it. Got Major Taylor us, doing a track doing stand. Better is not incremental. Yeah. It's about shifting gears. It's about a league with this one is better. diversity in its very DNA. Very but it's still not clear. We have the support of believers who saw our dream and who put their money where their mouth is with the largest private investment ever. Like, I know that those are the investors, but it doesn't say who any of them are. Corner one of Sonny King right there. This one does have, like, actual footage of a criterium, which is a step up. I don't know about racing 40 miles an hour, though. Like... I don't know about you, but I'm generally not hitting 40 miles an hour in, maybe, in many crits. Maybe in a downhill sprint with a tailwind. Um, yeah, t tailwind sprint maybe. I mean, I'm also break, not. Usually yeah, not the most. 40 is a, uh, like a social media worthy feat if you're sprinting over 40. Right, well, that's like a PB if you're hitting over 40. So yeah. first thing we want to talk about is who who is behind the NCL? That was our our big question when we started diving into it. They talk a lot about that seven point five million dollars, which is a lot of money for cycling, but also not a lot of money in the grand scheme. It's kind of this weird duality where cycling we're used to things being so poorly funded, but it's it's a big number, but it's not a big number. And then they also talk a lot about how the investors are. NFL players, NBA players, and Ben, you did some more digging on that. So launch into your, uh, your, your research there. Yeah. As a, as kind of a business guy, I like that side of it. Um, there's a lot of, I did a little research into who's, who the investors are. And I was trying to see if there's any like one big, like angel, like Mark Cuban kind of guy who was like, I'm going to put 5 million into this to get it started. And other people were kind of like nickel and diming it. It seems like there's, um, I want to say, as of recently, as of yesterday morning, according to Forbes, there's 15 investors that got 7.5 million. All of them are like NFL players or have connections to traditional sports. Um, it seems like a lot of them are folks who didn't have super long careers, not saying that in a negative way, and they want to take the money they made because traditional like football players make a ton of money, right? They're trying to find ways to to grow that, um, and they, they kind of found this avenue to do so. They make a ton of money, but there's a really short shelf life on those careers, so they've got to like take that money and right. continue to make it work for them. So investing in yep. things makes sense, and investing in something sports-related makes sense. It seems like the NCL, the people behind NCL, they have some like sports marketing people that are not like cycling endemic people. They're more like general sports marketing. One of the things I found is that they've partnered with Medalist, which medal if you're familiar with like the Medalist races, that was like Colorado Classic, Tour of Utah, uh, Tour of California. They still put on a few things. They did that Maryland Cycling Classic, which was like one of the only UCI races. They got like international uh, road riders to come to America last year. So they're still putting on high level events, but I think this, it seems like this partnership and it is a partnership. It's not like NCL is medalist. It's like NCL started and then they brought medalist on as like, it's unclear what the exact relationship is. It just says they're partnered. But my guess would be that NCL brought on medalist as someone who knows how to put on events basically and has done it at a high level. But I think it's, it shows that Medalist was saying, like, we kind of see road racing in America, like, waning. So where is there a growth potential? And NCL crit racing is where the growth potential was. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I think they see Medalist as a way to like, they know how to put on high quality events. They know how to get high quality video footage um, for those races and make sure they're streamed properly and things like that. Whereas some other folks may not be able to produce the quality that I think the NCL is looking for in some of the live streaming, especially with some of the the metrics that NCL is advertising as far as being able to see riders live data on screen with them being able to have onboard cameras that they can kind of pan to on certain riders or all the riders. Um, and I think Medalist is probably the only media company in the cycling space that would even be close to having that kind of um, potential to do well. Yeah, Medalist used to, when they were doing a tour of Utah, so I remember like when I was first following like American racing, um, probably like almost 10 years ago at this point, and they were doing tour of Utah, they had that tour tracker app, which was kind of like one of the first things of its kind where you could go in the app and not just see the live stream, but you could also look at like the profile and where the Peloton is on that profile. And there was like a little bit of live data. I mean, it was before you were seeing like live power being broadcast, but Metalist does have some like insight with that. Uh, speaking of which, I found a podcast. So I think between Ben and I, we've been talking about this for like a week. We had like a lengthy conversation last week about this where we were really not even thinking of it as a podcast. We were just talking about NCL, trying to figure out what was going on. And then since then, we've done all this research and I believe that between the two of us, we have listened to, seen, read like every piece of content that's out there about it, which is not a ton. There's a lot of print stuff. Like you mentioned, there is a Forbes piece, um, which is big. We're going to keep going back and forth between kind of like big upping them and being like, wow, it's crazy that they did that. And then also being like, but what is going on over here? So yeah, for crazy sure. that they got a piece in Forbes. Also, I should be able to find more than two videos about them, given that it's we're in 2023 and this league is starting in 2023. So it's kind of like a weird duality. But I did find one podcast. It's uh, Yin's Voigt's podcast with Bobby Julik, where they had on Kelly Staley, who works for NCL now, who used to work with Tour of California, some of those big medalist races that I was talking about. And she really just kind of regurgitated a lot of the same the same points that I'm seeing in all of these other articles we read, it was clear that like a lot of these articles were written from the same couple of press releases or whatever, but there were some things that she like maybe inadvertently let slip in there. And some of the stuff about the data platforms, it's pretty interesting. Um, ben was talking about what they're promising in terms of they're talking about live data on screen. They're talking about a, a metaverse component which like I kept seeing metaverse mentioned and it was unclear, but from reading each of these little pieces and putting them together, it seems like what they're driving toward is some, some sort of thing where like you can get on your trainer and ride along with the race, or you can get on your computer and like have some sort of like VR experience where maybe there's onboard cameras. And rather than it being like a stream that you watch, you're like going to their web page and there's like 10 riders with cameras and you can select which one you want to see, or you can look at whatever power data you want to see in real time. Seems like kind of a natural extension of that like tour tracker thing. I'm also again to like, you know, pros and cons. That sounds very cool. I would love to see that. They're trying to grow the sport. And they said in that podcast, she said they see their audience as like, 30% or 40% people who are not already like endemic cycling fans. So they're trying to draw those people in. I think something that's like on its own pro proprietary platform and just like bombarding you with a ton of information may be like off-putting. Like you have to be a huge dork to get on the tour tracker and like click through all the stuff and even like know when and where to find it. Yeah. I do think, and this is part of why I've done what I've done in the past year two years i do think that like these races the channels are out there to get video content out there and you need to be on the channels people are already on like it's crazy to me that 
uh, ACC last year wasn't just on YouTube, Twitch already, because that's how you catch people that are not seeking out a bike race necessarily. Well, yeah, if you think about it, like even like back when I was probably five, four or five years ago, like USA Cycling streamed the national championships for free on YouTube, right? So yeah. like, and you would stump, like, I didn't know they were doing that. I would just stumble upon like a random national championship race from like 2016 and be like, well, I got some homework to do. I was running this background. Um, right. And that's sort of where you're going to catch people who are not fans. Like if you're talking about live data, there's a certain, even cyclists, recreational cyclists don't give a shit about power. Like in, so a, a non-cyclist is not going to care about the data, like 191 BPM on heart rate doesn't mean anything to somebody who's not an athlete. Um, and power, they're not going to know what a watt means in relation to cycling, and it's not going to carry that same weight. Uh, we're supposed to you or I, if we see someone doing 500 watts for a minute, like we know what that means. We know how hard that is to do. Someone who's not um, super inundated into the sport, they're not going to have that same reaction. I don't, I don't know. You kind of, It's the same thing. Like You just have to be into the sport at a certain level to even invest that much to get on the metaverse to really invest the time into doing the, the data portion. Of yeah. It. So I guess the question there, and this is where we're going to be doing some wild speculation here, just because there's like not that much out there about what these races are going to be. But that's where we can speculate a little bit about like, you know, what, what form that takes is going to, is going to determine the the interest level for people. If the only way to watch these races is like, you have to go to ncl.com or you have to download the NCL app. And then that's the only way to see it. And you have to uh, click through, even if it's a great interface, like there will be people who will do that. And I think I've seen that from Zwift racing is like, you know, you said people by and large, even recreational cyclists don't care about data. You know, there is that hardcore group that like really wants to see the data and that's how you're going to hook oh, them. Sure. So I think it's, it's great that they're showing that or they're like thinking about that. But if that's the only way there is to interact with that, I think that's going to be, that's going to hold some people back. Um, yeah, so I can think of, about the, like the percentage of people in America that ride bikes. And you think about the part of that pie that races America's or cares about it. League, the NCL has know, announced that there's less, less and less um, as yeah. you sort of into the data. We're talking about fractions of the percentage that people who are going to be that super interested in like clever Martinez's watts on a lap, you know? Yeah. You're, you're fragmenting an already small, small pie, but for those hardcore people, they're going to love it's, it is going to take the coverage like up a level again, depending on what that mm -hmm. looks like. It could be, it could be awesome or it could just be like totally inscrutable. Yeah. I'm interested. Sure. I mean, as a guy who does a bunch of e-racing and stuff, like I'm interested in, it was specifically mentioned on that podcast, like something about getting on your indoor trainer and interacting with the race in some way, what form that takes, uh, we'll have to see, but like, and the reason we're going to have to see is that there is again, no media about this thing. So this video is one of the only other videos on YouTube about NCL. And it's from this very strange YouTube channel called, uh, sports, uh, let's see sports royalty and this whole channel like the vibe of this channel is like a uh, russian uh deep fake it's like it sounds like it might even be like a fake voice thing um it's uh yeah I'll, i'm i'm just gonna play this video we're gonna watch this one so this video strangely is like even worse produced than the first ncl video we watched but contains more information and I think I'm going to watch really closely this time. I've watched it several times. I think there are a couple of the same shots of stock footage in this video. 2023 season will have a staggering prize purse worth $1 million. Such high stakes would certainly make the 2023 season a good watch. In this video, we'll take a look at the announcement, what it means, and other prizes that shocked the world. So jump onto your at-home cycling machines and let's jump into it. And before we begin, please subscribe to our channel and like this video. It will be greatly appreciated. First up, the $1 million prize. It's fair to say. 
it feels like every line is like da 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 and i can't tell if that's like one of those fake voices that like reads things on tiktok or if that's a guy who's trying to sound like one of those voices but either way it's very like uncanny valley yeah for sure throwing me off say that all participants will try their hardest and always have their eyes on the prize once they hear the prize that is up for grabs the ncl is no doubt trying to attract as same as same as footage as this is the same as the guys descending from that other video so this is not on the ncl channel and it's spliced with so i don't know if like ncl paid them to do this or if like this whole channel is like a plant by the same people who are making the stuff for ncl and they're trying to like create a separate channel because a lot of the other videos on this channel are like similar stuff to this but it's like it's kind of like clickbaity cycling news stuff it's like uh uh ghana says he's fast and gets the hour record and it's like a picture of ghana like oh and they're all right. like these like five minute videos but I'm going to keep letting this one run because there is some more actual info in this one. ...lists as possible back to the sport. With this, they are trying to expand the viewership of the sport, and who doesn't want to see that? If you're wondering why this league is turning so many heads at this time, it's because there has never been a prize... Same shot, same guy posting up in tennis shoes. ...purse as big as this in the history of the American cycle racing. Thanks to this prize purse, many big names are expected to be seen cycling for their teams. Let's hope the turn... Cycling for their teams out this year is bigger than ever before next up about the league there will be 10 teams fighting for the grand prize there will be one team from each of the 10 cities selected kind of like how it is in basketball okay so that's not true that's what they're working toward right now there are two teams and we'll talk about who those teams are and where where they're from or whatever but there are two like geographical teams the rest of the teams racing are going to be teams that already exist that are coming in to race NCL. What they are building towards is like a, a sort of closed league with 10 teams that are all geographically based, but they're not there yet. Two of these teams will be NCL specific teams and the other eight will be invited. These 10 teams will have 16 cyclists, eight male. So those other eight teams will not be geographically based like they female. said the male and female races will be held separately but all athletes will be paid equally all race winners will score points for their respective teams but not to worry there will be points for other racers on offer too Tradi so someone in chat mentioned being confused us too jk that's how we ended up doing this like we the more we went down this rabbit hole the more questions we had so the, his question is uh We've only seen two teams from the NCL, Colorado and Miami, where are the rest? What, from what I understand from reading all these articles and listening to that podcast is that the NCL owns two teams. Those two teams will do all of the NCL races. And additionally, they're going to go race some, some other stuff, some uh, American uh, Criterium Cup. Um, they do not... I'm responding to the chat a little bit. The show is live. Someone in the chat asked if there's going to be fixed gear criterium racing. I think there was just stock footage of fixed gear in here. It's again, seems like to me from the stuff I've consumed that there will only be two events. There's going to be like a men's pro race and a women's pro race. And the points from those will be combined. I'm going to get into what I think about the point system after this video, because it does cover it a little bit, but I don't think there will be a fixed gear component. Although I would love to be wrong about that. Additionally, the person who crosses the finish line gets all the glory and all of the points. This time, however, the NCL has introduced a new method of awarding points on a lap-to-lap -lap basis. This way, viewers would be entertained for the whole duration of the race instead of just tuning in towards the end to see who wins. As for the locations for the races... I'm going to stop it there and talk about the points. Yeah. So, the points... It, they said it here. They've, they're saying it uh, on the... Um, they were saying it on the podcast. They were saying points will be awarded on every lap. We don't have a structure for like how many points and if those will be weighted differently. They did make it seem like there will be premiums of different value, but there will be some amount of points on every lap. And then this video kind of hinted at it, but then also didn't make it super clear. But the points for the all the teams will have a men and a women's. That's what I said. It sounds like AI. <laughs> I'm responding yeah. to chat again. It does sound like I can't, it might be an AI voice. I don't know, but it's got that weird thing. There will be a men's and a women's team. 
those points will go into the same bucket. And then rather than the person who crosses the line first at the end of the weight race winning the race, the winner will be the team, men's and women's, with the most combined. Seems like there's not going to be like an individual podium and then a team podium. It seems like it's just going to be that larger podium. Which I think for like them trying to bring this to a wider audience – will make sense for the non-cycling fan to know that Denver Disruptors scored 26 points over the race. They beat the team that only scored 24 points. They're the winners so, and the team wins. This is another, okay, it's going to make it more interesting for those people watching because I have so many conversations on the side sidelines of a crit. Like every year at Athens Twilight, I end up talking to some random people who are like, what is going on? Like, why are those guys over there and these guys are over here? Why doesn't everyone just sprint right now? And explaining that stuff is really hard, like as the race is going on as to why the groups form how they do and how the breakaways work and stuff. It will be more straightforward if you can just stand at the finish line and say like, that person crossed first, they scored points. That person crossed first. Now, where it's going to get complicated is like, say I'm at the event, how do I no, like, is there a board where I can see what the points are? Because it's going to become like ZRL. It's another point I wanted to make, and I kind of put it in the title of this video. I see a lot of parallels to the ZRL, the Zwift Racing League here. One of them is the points-based thing. Like, they're trying to, uh, like, insert all of these mid-race points premiums, and it seems like every lap will be points here, whereas ZRL, you know, it varies, but trying to insert mid-race points to encourage more action and more stuff to happen. But much like ZRL, we we did, or you guys did ZRL and I DS'd it last night over on my Twitch channel. We got to the end of the race and some of the guys were like, all right, how do we see who won? And I was like, you can't. Right. It's just, it's totally opaque. We'll go to another website tomorrow and then we'll find out because there's no heads up points display. Like you don't cross a sprint and then see who got points. I, I imagine like with some of the, the apparatus that they're saying each rider will wear, it'll sign of say, Hey, I'm using Cody Martinez's name a lot because he's popular and I know he's racing for one of the NCL teams. Yeah. It'll say Cody Martinez crossed the line this lap in fourth place. That's worth two points. Right. And it'll kind of show like a bucket saying, like there's got to be some sort of heads up display or scoreboard yeah. somewhere on the finish line that says it has all 10 teams and it says Miami has this amount of points. Denver has this amount of points. CS fellow has this amount of points. Um, so it's just going to be a matter of like how straightforward is all that information? How is it like presented to people who are not. Ooh, okay. Some someone, thank you uh, in the okay. chat. Clock cutters okay. has has dropped some knowledge here. <laughs> Fit insider, yeah. So that's what we're finding about a lot of these things. Uh, there's a quote: the NCL centers around criterium or crit racing, one of cycling's fastest growing disciplines. Their race is done on short tracks using thick, fixed gear bikes without brakes. That's from Fit Insider on August 23rd. But it sounded like sounds like the author doesn't know what they're talking about. It seems like they're just like they're outsourcing this stuff to like people who make media who are not necessarily cycling endemic, which is like maybe good on one. They they can talk to those non endemic people, but they kind of don't know where they're ta what they're talking about. I guess so I think again, it's one of those things where the media outlets they're going to are not cycling specific media outlets, and so you have a lot of people like, for example, Forbes or like the Fit Insider, where they're getting this name out to non-cycling people. But now us cycling nerds, right? You and I have both been in bikes for 10 to 15 years at this point, if not our whole lives. Like, we're out in the cold. Like, where, where's all this info? Like, we need to know more and more. And Forbes is like, hey, this new bike series is happening. Like, go watch it. And that's sort of all we're left with, which is kind of yeah. maybe indicative of who's – of like where all this is coming from. So Garrett in the chat has just gotten to a point that was definitely on my list over here, which is if there are points on every lap, maybe it becomes equally boring. And I do think that's a possibility that if every lap is a points lap, it may encourage the kind of, like, you're not going to sprint every lap. You could sprint every five laps. Maybe they'll be weighted different. So it's like, 
there's one point every lap. I'm just going to talk about what I would like to see. Maybe there's one point available for the leader on every lap, and that's kind of encouraging people to get in breakaways. But every fifth lap is like a huge points premium. And these are, you know, I'm imagining like two minute laps. So these things are ticking off pretty quickly. They're, they haven't specified what any of the courses are and whether they're going to be endemic courses that already exist in the sport. But they've, they've kind of suggested they're going to be around a, a K long. Uh, so a yeah. kilometer so long, they're going to be like which, standard crit courses. They might be, is that like a hair long, maybe like maybe closer to, to two minutes, maybe to, to complete one lap instead of. A typical minute. That sounds and a, a little shorter. That's not like I think the Hammerfest course last year, which was like pretty short, that's like 1K, just about, okay. if I gotcha. remember correctly. Um, On the points. So I, I, they're, the devil is, with all these things, the devil is in the details. Like it could be great that they're showing all this data. It could be the coolest thing we've ever seen. But if it's not packaged in a way that is easily understandable. It can be lost on people. And I have like mixed feelings about it because it's the same thing with this media strategy where like getting it out to all of these non endemic cycling publications is a good thing, especially if they're trying to focus on that market, but the details are just not there, which makes me think like the, the execution may be lacking. Speaking of the weird execution, I'm going to go back to this, uh, this video, we'll finish this one off. There's actually an ad in here we're going to have to skip, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Denver and Washington. There will be four races held in these four cities, but they won't just be races. The aim is to make... So that glossed over one of the next points I wanted to talk about, but this year, 2023, they're doing four races in four cities. They're doing Miami, Atlanta, Denver, and Washington, D.C. Now on the podcast, she specified that the Miami race is the only one... She didn't say a date, but she said... Miami, I'm looking at my notes here, Miami in March on Ocean Drive on spring break. So somebody tell me, is there normally, I don't think there's normally a race uh, that time of year, a big race in Miami. Is there historically a crit that uses Ocean Drive as the course? I'm going to try to like crowdsource this to you guys because I don't go down and race in Miami. It also seems crazy. I mean, Miami's like a big market. That's a big city. And that's what they're going for is these big city downtown kind of vibe type situations, even more so than like ACC has focused on these middle markets, like your kind of Boise's, like that level of, of city. It seems like they want to take it even bigger to like major A1 markets. But mm -hmm. yeah, is there is there a crit? So like, obviously there are big races. Atlanta's got like Grant Park. There's several spin the district races, but yeah, I don't know the history in, uh, in Miami. So somebody let me know if Miami has a big race that I don't know about. In themselves. There will be family events. Same shot. Guy squeezing the brake lever. Apart from the occasional attractions, there will be some treats for those watching from their homes. The oh, here we go. Adam, I'm going to skip that. We'll get right back into it. Yeah, I think I was, they're they're targeting the big city thing kind of. It's a good thing because it's going to get more eyeballs, right? There's way more people in Atlanta than there is in Boise. Their perspectives um, are screens. Yeah, I no, it's, that's sort of indicative. Like they're trying to get non-cyclists into the sport, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think these big city markets where like your Atlantas, your Miamis, your Denvers, like the percentage of non-cyclists to like general population you're going to get a lot more traffic as opposed to like in Athens. Right. So yeah, I think that's a really, really good thing that they're trying to bring this to major, major cities. But even talking about the Athens thing, like I was saying, I always get into these conversations with people who are just standing around, like wondering what it is. If you can get into yeah. these dense population centers, people do happen upon it. And I've talked to people there who like, I'm, I'm explaining to them how the racing works and whatever, I was talking to somebody in like 2019 and they were like, yeah, I've been coming to this for 10 years. Like we always just come down here, but I never knew what was going on really. <laughs> so like, that's the gap to bridge is like, it is inherently like fun to watch. And like a crit is a good atmosphere. It's just like, it's set up for a good time, but then we have to like make that connection because there's a lot of people who are not going to consistently come for 10 years. They're going to see it and be like, this is cool. And then just, you know, in one ear and out the other. Yep. And that's not really growing the sport. It's like 
getting exposure, but it's not growing. So jumping back in after that commercial, it's going to start straight on some stuff about the metaverse. So I'm going to try to key into this. Fans will be able to ride with their favorite rider. Are you pumped for next season already? If not, then don't go anywhere because we have... Fans will be able to ride with their favorite rider. I don't know what that means. She did mention on the podcast something about using your indoor trainer to do that. So it's see, it seems like maybe because they're talking about having onboard cameras on every rider, like maybe in the metaverse, I can get on my trainer and ride with my screen showing like Frank Traviesos, um like cam, right? Yeah. I'm wondering That's if we're talking like avatars, like a Zwift situation or like, like you're, and when they keep saying metaverse, do they mean like, is this a thing where like people call all soda Coke or whatever? Like, are we talking about the Facebook brand metaverse? Because so. she, she, okay. She did say they keep using the term metaverse, but then when she was talking about their like broadcast partners and like the ways the races are going to be getting out there, she was like, yeah, we have a big partner for that, but we can't, announce who it is because Jens Voigt was kind of pressing her on like the TV coverage, not pressing, but like he just kept hammering, like you got to have, and he kept saying TV, but Jens is old. Like he doesn't know. He means like streaming or broadcasting or whatever. Yeah. He's like, who's your TV partner? Like who, who will, will you broadcast on local stations or whatever? And she kept saying like, we have a big partner, but we can't announce it yet. Which does make me think that, they're talking about like Facebook brand metaverse, which I actually think would be if metaverse is the only place to see these races, like we may brave them so that we can cover them here. But like, I don't think you're going to get a lot of people putting on the damn Oculus Rift. Yeah, there's, there's a big like gap where like I have to go buy a virtual reality apparatus to do this thing. And now I'm going to use that to watch this bike race. And a lot of people, aren't really going to do that. And so I think if it's only in the metaverse, the only way to access the content is through the metaverse. I don't see that as a good thing. And maybe someone maybe in the chat, what I, but yeah, no, same. If that's the only way that's going to be a huge drawback to them. But if it is one of the ways it could be a big step forward. Yeah. For sure. Someone in the, speaking of which someone in the chat mentioned that this screenshot paused a uh, screenshot of the video we're watching looks like the app full gas and yeah i could see it feeling like a full gas or a suffer fest um if it is like you're watching frank traviesa's onboard camera and like suffer fest has i think like the, the my favorite thing in suffer fest is these pro rides where it takes onboard footage from like a world tour rider takes their power file and then matches it to your power profile in erg mode so you can like watch their race from their perspective. And when they're doing FTP, you're doing FTP. Now their FTP is probably well above yours, but like it scales to you. That if it was doing that in real time, that would be a really fun way to do it. I find I this agree. to be super yeah. engaging. All right, I'm gonna let this run. There's loads more to tell you. By the end, you will be buzzing with excitement. Next, who wins what? As much as the winning team may want, it's so hard for me to not just pause it constantly and, and crack on the delivery of this video. They won't win the four right. million dollars. That would obviously be unfair to all the other participants. The NCL has divided the prize purse into five parts to be awarded to the top five teams. Come to the end of the season, the teams will have found their places on the table with each team scoring as many points as they possibly could. The teams will have found their places on the table. Now, the team in first place will obviously have won the league, so they will win the largest portion of the prize purse. For I don't know if you can just use GCN footage, right? The guys it's GCN footage fair splice. Use. As long as they don't use the audio, I think it's fair use, right? I don't oh, know. yeah, maybe. First place would win a massive $700,000. That's 70% of all of the money up for grabs, so first place is definitely the place to be. Second place would win $150,000, which, not being quite as much as the sum awarded to first place, is still good. So they're, they're talking a big game about these big prize purses, and those are big numbers, but then you think about... That's per team, and then those teams are the men's and women's is one team. So it's eight riders a team. This is another thing I had wondered about that I kind of got some clarity on piecing it together from all these sources is how many people are going to be on a team? Eight men, eight women. And then how big are these fields going to be? Six people race at a time. 
10 teams, 60 person field, which I actually like. I think that field size, especially if the courses are going to be this small, field size is going to be a limiting factor. And it's, I think it caused a lot of crashes last year. We saw a lot of crashes in the bigger races where there were like 120 person elite fields at Tulsa. And another factor there is that these are going to be invitation only races. That's something I only heard in the podcast, but these will be invitation only races. And I'll talk a little bit more about who they might be inviting after we finish this video. Third place will be awarded $75,000 and fourth will win 50. The last of the award winning teams will be the fifth place with a measly 25 grand. These prices may seem unfair to the teams in third, fourth, and fifth, but if all the teams were given equal amounts of money, no one would dig down deep to get their team up a place or two. Any amount won would be fully deserved by any team that wins. After all, every sport is worthless without the players and the athletes. That's why all sports pay so much to their athletes because it is their efforts that contribute to the fan experience. I don't think you have to just like explain how salaries work. There's, right. there's a lot of this video. I feel like it was important for us to like slog through this thing because there is like the breakdown of, of how, how big this prize purse is. This is the only place I've seen that information, but you have to like slog through this weird ass video to get it. Founder of NCL, Harris Wallace said that creating the next generation of sports community starts. You want to talk a little bit about Paris Wallace? That's a good place. Yeah. I know you did some digging yeah. on him. So that's the founder of this thing. I'm going to get back yeah. to. So, so, find so Paris idea. Wallace. Yeah. So Paris Wallace is sort of, I don't want to use the phrase career entrepreneur, uh, but he's like a Harvard business guy. Um, very like, he's like a 40 under 40 kind of person um, started a, a women's health organization. Um, eventually I, don't think he's running that anymore. Um, so he's he's brought in now as the CEO of the NCL. I think yeah, he's not running that anymore. He he sold yep. that was a company called Ovia, like Ovia. Health. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So he's not so running he is that a, anymore. He is a cyclist. He sold that company and then was like sort of retired for a brief brief period, and then was just like, I like cycling. I want to do something with cycling. In yep. NCL. It's like all these guys, like they're like, they get bored when they retire because they spend so much time, like they love to work and they love to build things and do that. And so one thing that I think is interesting is whether he's in NCL, whether he plans to stay as a long-term uh, leader of the organization or if he plans to build it to a certain point and then possibly sell it um, and do sort of what he did as what typical startup CEOs do is build it, sell it, move on. Um, and so I really hope it's not the latter of those and that he's really focused on growing and being a long-term leader for the organization, but he's definitely sort of like a, an entrepreneur business type guy. So they were talking about it, like it's a long-term thing on that podcast, but they weren't saying they were going to own it long-term. They're saying they're like building it so that it can be a long-term entity. And yeah, I think these guys, that's just what they know is like build it and sell it. And it's also like a thing that these, these like, super rich business guys who get um, interested in cycling and then are like, oh, I want to do this thing. I'm thinking Oleg Tinkov uh, yeah. from recent memories, like Russian oligarch who ran a team for a little while and then, you know, he just got tired of it. So we may also see that where I think it's actually good that the money, like as you did that deep dive, there's not just like one guy who's the money man. Like this is the idea yeah. guy but I think it's good that the money is actually seems to be spread pretty equally among a lot of backers. So yep, it's not absolutely. just like one guy's pet project. Anyway. Yeah. Harris Wallace said that creating the next generation of sports community starts with valuing the athletes and their contributions to the fan experience. He realizes that for the sport to find new athletes from the newer generations, there must be an incentive in the sport. Otherwise, who would choose to depend solely on their income from said sports? And then what does having a big prize purse do? So, it, talking about the athletes and paying them and stuff. I haven't heard an actual number, but Yims, Yins and Bobby acted like they had heard a number and they liked the number. Actually, that wasn't Yins and Bobby. I found another podcast that was talking about um, NCL for like 10 minutes. But it seemed like they knew the organizers, but they weren't talking about who they knew or the numbers they had heard. But they they were saying that the writers are being paid a reasonable salary, which been theorized that maybe it's something like the UCI minimum, which what was that? 
it's like if you translate it to U.S. dollars, it's somewhere between that fifty and sixty thousand. It's forty thousand euros um, as of twenty twenty one. So hitting that, which in theory is a livable wage, especially in cycling and American cycling, it's I mean fifty times what some what some of these guys make on these really small teams. So you right. know, if we're talking about that number, it's for American cycling very very large. And they also mentioned that they have a, a salary cap, and that salary cap is the same for men and women. So I think the salary cap it makes it where we're going to get away from the uh, the days of like the early two thousands, where a domestic elite team would basically buy like one ringer who was a guy who was like kind of on his way down from the. I mean, a lot of times it was just ex dopers who like got a ban in Europe, served the ban, no one wanted to mess with them, and then they come over here. I'm thinking. Francisco Mancebo was over here racing for a while. Um, guys like that. But then you would have like Mancebo's making 100K or, you know, I'm making this numbers up, n- these numbers up, but I think this is an accurate ballpark. Mancebo's making 100K and then the guy who's getting Mancebo's bottles is making like, maybe he's getting two grand a year from his contract and he's also like gets to keep one of his team bikes at the year, at the end of the year. He's putting that on eBay. But yeah. like that's it. So there was a huge inequity. So it does seem like this league is like bringing those things, trying to bring those things in line, and even across men's and women's, which is good. I think like placing equal weight on like the points and the money from both. That seems like a positive step to me. Yeah, equality Again, I haven't is a big heard... thing. Like missing in cycling, especially at the yeah. international level, is. I mean, to this day, women are racing an hour to an hour and a half shorter than the man we saw it at. Australian world champs like last weekend, right? The women's race was maybe two hours shorter than the men's race. Like, and so for them to bring like equal pay, show that women are providing equal value to the men and the whole league and the whole scheme of things is amazing. Really, really strong. And in American racing, at least in the past, like crit racing, especially recently, the women's race has been more fun to watch than the men's. Like it's been, even with the Legion dominance kind of on both sides, a lot of these women's races have been much more uh, more interesting. And I said I haven't seen an exact number, but I, I think that UCI minimum number kind of makes sense because we're seeing, and that's kind of the next thing I want to get into after this, is like who is actually signed on and racing uh, in this league for these two teams that are, you know, inside inside the league that are doing all the races. We'll get into that next. But they're pulling some big names like Clever Martinez, who you've mentioned who he was on Miami Blazers last season, which I mean, I think Legion and Blazers like domestically were probably paying the best salaries. So I think to pull riders away from teams like that, and even a couple like down from world tour makes me think that they're in that ballpark. Do. An important prize is up for grabs doesn't only mean the athletes will be awarded for their hard work. It means much more from a business standpoint, starting with the attention that it brings to the event. The athletes who wouldn't normally come to the event make an effort to get a chance to compete for the prize. With better and more importantly famous athletes take part in the event, more fans are given the incentive to come to watch their favorites. That boosts ticket sales and for the NCL events... No ticket sales. She specifically said in the podcast that they're, that it's a non-ticketed event. Maybe there will be like metaverse tickets at some point, but like the guy who asked the question about the fix here, I think that's just a, that statement was a um, function of the fact that they don't know what they're talking about. I think that's a good place to jump over to the roster and start talking about like who is actually doing these things. Yeah, for sure. So we got two, 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 it's, so confusingly on their page, the teams are not actually on the teams page. They're on this press release page. If I scroll down far enough, I will get to the actual list. Okay, we have the Denver Disruptors, eight men and eight women. Um, There is a list down here, there and it's go. not in any sort of order or, or like... Okay, I'm going to their their Instagram page because it's it's much easier to see who who all's on these teams over here. Uh, Frank Travieso also coming over from Blazers. I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. Uh, Leah Kirch is coming from DSM. That's one of those like coming down from the World Tour that I think you know 
it means this money must be okay. Yeah. Um, Riley Sheehan from coming from Premier Tech. I think he was on the Premier Tech Israel Premier Tech um, like feeder team. I don't think he was on the main team, but I don't think he was on the World Tour team either. I think he was on that U twenty three development, whatever yeah. that ended up, whatever that is for them team. And then a couple guys from Wildlife Generation, uh, Johnny Clark and Kent Ross. Johnny Clark, big Australian racer. I think he raced World Tour at one point. Yeah. Clever Martinez, we mentioned, um, coming off of a pretty good season with Blazers last year, although I think he maybe wanted – this actually makes me interested that he is going to be on a team that is not run by the Williams brothers because Blazers, I think this is a good time to get into the legion of it all. But – Blazers is owned by Legion, um, and there's a lot of parallels that I'm seeing here. I mentioned like the uh, ZRL parallels already. Uh, there's also a lot of parallels from this to Lions Den. So Lions Den was the race that Legion put on two years ago, I guess now, but it had geographically based teams, no amateur event, invite only, boasted about like big prize purse. Um, Legion like owned the whole thing like they owned the two teams that were competing and then they filled the rest of the roster out with these like uh, like aspirational teams I guess but they were all yeah. geographically based or whatever the, the name was geographic like it'd be like the uh, like the Boise whatever but then it would have somebody from like Washington DC on the Boise team like I think they were just but that's placeholder yeah. games. Yeah. That that's the same thing here. I mean, they're trying to build yeah. it's like I mean, players in the NBA get traded around team to team. Yep. They're not necessarily like from the city that they're representing. So yeah. Uh sure. I, I see that parallel and like talking about all the the riders, um Taylor Cook White is another one that I wanted to mention. If you've been watching Cyclocross, she's had some really good results in Europe at the uh, like super prestige World Cup, like that super high level. I think she's kind of like a sleeper hit to maybe watch this next season. But yeah, she's from Philadelphia. Like you can see here, she's in the Philly Bike Expo or Phil yeah, I think it's Philly Bike Expo. She's in a Philadelphia based team kit from Philadelphia. I think still lives there, but racing for the Miami Knights. So I guess they'll probably build out those first four cities uh, first, the first four cities that they're having these races in. Yeah. Uh, build a team for each of them so that there's like a home team when they go to these races, which again, makes sense. And I think for the local fans that aren't going to know who these people are just being like, I'm in Miami watching this race, the Miami team scored a point, you know, like you have something to root for. Yeah. It's good simplicity. But talking about the, the connection, the um, sort of Legion comparison or the, the comparison to Lions Den, but then also just like what Legion's trying to build in general. Because uh, if you look at these jerseys, um, you've got on the back of these things, there's a number. There are no sponsors on the jersey. Very similar to Lions Den. And didn't you look into it? And there's a, there's a crossover personnel wise there, right? Yeah. So funny enough. Um... There's a guy named Reed McAlvin who has sort of been like in a Swanee athlete support role for a couple of different teams, Israel and um, Action hoggins -Burn. And so he eventually, I think in 2021 or 2020, that sort of time frame was working with Legion um, as sort of like same kind of thing, Swanee athlete support role. Um, Reed McAlvin and basically at some point – with within the past couple of years, he knew what Justin and Corey were trying to do with sort of a city based cycling league thing and said, you know what, when you get this off the ground, rounded up a bunch of investors or found people who wanted to do it and got connected. That's a little bit of a gray area how he sort of got involved with the with the group of people we see right now. Um, For this in here too. Like that that idea of like geographically based teams um, wor working toward like moving away from that sponsor. That's also something that USA Crits was like working toward. Yeah. But they didn't like 
in the same way that I guess Legion never like fully delivered or hasn't to date fully delivered on the lion's den idea. Yeah. It never fully metastas- metastasized, but go so on. So now we okay. sort of get into the, the article, um, the, the cycling weekly article that was pulled up. Basically Reed brought Justin to this group of investors and they presented to Justin or Justin presented. And eventually they parted ways with Justin deciding that it wasn't the right opportunity for him, which basically he said they had different goals, for long-term goals for how it was supposed to be, which sort of makes me think of what I had suggested earlier when talking about CEO Paris Wallace, where the, the idea is to build it and sell it. I think Justin wants to own all the teams. I think he wants to be the guy who's running it. And it's the Justin, like, not the Justin Williams this, but like he's sort of the name that comes up when you talk about the national cycling thing. And I think Justin wanted to head it up. Uh, basically, that's sort of what the vibe I got. Um, he sort of suggested in this article here that Legion is likely to not participate in this in this league, which makes me think there may be some ill will or so not this, ill will, uh, but bad blood there. Yeah, this, this is where it kind of gets spicy is – is this league a gimmick or the future of American bike racing? Like the only thing I've seen that's presented any kind of like potentially critical angle, which again, I'm not on the, like either side of the fence here. One, 100% of like, uh, this league is BS or this is going to be the thing that saves American racing. Like, I think there's definitely pros and cons to it, but the, uh, so my first, how this whole conversation started was we were talking about it, Ben and I, and I like, I think this is, legion's thing i think that legion is behind this but they got clowned on so hard for owning the lines in race and being the promoter that they're backing away from it in a public sense but what we will find out over time is like they're going to announce the other teams and then the last two teams they'll announce will be blazers and then the last team will be legion because it was so similar. I mean, it was obviously just the same model they had been working toward. Yep. So that's why we started doing all this digging. And then when Ben found out that there was, you know, these ideas had maybe originated in the same group of people, but then broken apart. That was pretty interesting. And there's a quote from Justin in this article from Cycling Weekly. You just scrolled. You're right at it. I'm at it. Oh, here's something about Legion. Williams added that Legion, this isn't the quote, but Williams added that Legion has yet to determine its 2023 schedule and could not comment on whether the team or any of its riders would make an appearance at the inaugural NCL series, which confused me today. So that came out earlier, Ben Ben was like, that sounds like he's telling them to F off without really saying it. (laughs) It's like the, the PR version of like, yeah, fat chance. We'll see. I mean, if this does end up being like the big thing that's going on, I think they had some friction with USA Cycling in the final of USA Cycling, but still did those races because that's like where the eyeballs were. But yeah. Okay. Here's the spicy quote. Justin Williams, CEO and racer of Legion, told told Cycling Weekly, the NCL is hiring a former employee of ours who's taken our vision to continue to grow the sport with him. He introduced me to this group of 2021 investors. However, we weren't aligned with our objectives on how to grow the sport, and there were some fundamental distant differences. Being encouraged the NCL to take the necessary steps to cultivate meaningful connections with the communities where the races will be held. Legion will continue to grow our vision for cycling until the right partners come along that we believe can take it to the next level. Our goal is to continue to focus on blah, 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 a bunch of, you know, marketing speak, but I think the the key there is like, yeah, they kind of took our identity with him and he like took our, our idea. I don't know. That seems like, yeah. you know, a good car spin, but doesn't seem like Legion is super stoked on this. And I do think yeah, it like, sounds like, like Reed took the idea and said, oh, you don't want to do it? Well, I'm still going to do it. And now Justin's like, well, screw this Reed guy. I don't want to work with this and I don't like these guys because they're not going to let me be the be the leader and i think justin there's this critiques on justin on the racing side but i think business wise like he grew legion he's you know built he's got a lot of sponsors and connections i think he's 
business savvy to an extent. And I think he wanted to be the, be the guy doing this. Um, and I I'm going to say, I think it's a good time to get into pros and cons here and like yep. pros and cons of the Legion thing. If Legion was doing this instead, I don't think we would be watching like garbage AI videos. Like they do I know agree. how to, how to make things that pop on social media. Um, you know, love them or hate them. They've got followers. They, they understand yeah. how to use this stuff. It seems like the aspect of it has been lost. I mean, they've also yeah, just we, got the like enthusiasm and the eyeballs. So yeah. they're these teams are starting from a zero level. No one knows what Denver Disruptors is, you know, until yeah. the last week they're, or whatever. Yeah, the kind of thing that the the new league, the Denver Disruptors, they're trying to ride kind of off the coattails of who the individual riders in the team are. Like they're trying to capitalize on people who like Clever Martinez already, people who like Sergio Hanau already, people who know who Swain Tuft is, people, you know, that sort of thing. They're trying to use that as sort of the platform to then elevate the whole team. So they did talk about on the podcast, the riders are signing not only their contract to ride for the team, but also entertainment contracts, which it kind of alluded to that could yeah. include some sort of like reality TV side uh, that that could like grow some of these personalities that are not um, already as well known. So, you know, in, in coming years, we may see like the clever Martinez like mini series, you know, to kind of like mm-hmm. build him up to a Justin level. I think that's where their head's at. And they're also signing HIPAA contracts so that they can do all that yeah. um, biometric like, I don't know if they're going to be like posting their blood work or whatever, but that's, you know, they made it sound like the contract is like, we can post anything about your um, biometrics anywhere. So we may see like way more detailed analysis of like who these riders are and their, their power curves and their uh, workout routines and like all of that kind of stuff to also to, to build like the two sides, like the personality side and then like kind of the data dork side of of caring about these racers individually i wonder with sort of the the netflix tour de france thing being talked about and it seems like it's real um i wonder if they're the entertainment contract is so the ncl can produce high quality like behind the scenes race thing like if you watch the yumbo visma tour de france video where they had all the behind the scenes stuff and the lead up into it and here's Denver Disruptors at the race, and this is how their race played out. This is the after, sort of like a mini Netflix series or documentary or like an HBO Max, like, like a uh, season kind of, kind of structure. Like a F1 Drive to Survive. Yeah, so like, exactly I do think that's that. a good idea, but like, like all these things, the devil's in the details, I think they're yeah. maybe like a little bit behind on this because like in a post-Drive to Survive world, there's so much, and even like they have to win in the stage pass. Ulrika Green Edge was doing those backstage pass YouTube videos. They those were like so kind of good. the only yeah. ones. Yeah, those were great. Yeah. But they were kind of the only ones doing that at the time. So they had so much focus on them. But now there's like the Movie Star Netflix series. There's there have been run these like uh, there was the picture box focus like American Criterion thing a couple of years ago. Like this content is out there, so they're gonna have to figure out like a new spin on it. And it could be that like marrying it with the live stuff is kind of that that new spin. But I mean, it's the same thing with like when J Powell had behind the barriers, that was like the only cycling vlog. But now every cyclocross racer at a high level has a vlog, and it's, it's like spread that audience out. Yeah, it's sort of like a an entry level requirement to being an elite bike racer in America. This right. one is to have some sort of YouTube channel or vlog or something like that. Yeah. And they're all kind of doing like the same or enlarge the same kind of vlog where it's like, I woke up and here's what I ate and here's a snippet of my conversation. And it really is like the, it's the behind the barriers model. Like all of the cyclocross racers are just doing their own behind the barriers now, which is good, but it's not going to get you as an individual as far as it used to. Like, yeah, behind the barriers is probably one of the main things that like hooked me into cyclocross. And I know a lot of other people who got into it around that Louisville World Championship time where, yeah, that's true for them. But 
I wonder if that's still true. Maybe it is, but it's like there's rather than being this many people who are like, oh, I got into it from Jeremy Powers thing. There's like this many who watch Cameron Mason and that's how they got into it. And this many who yeah. got into it from Caleb Schwartz and this, and it just goes on. on that. And, and we know like Jay Powell got his GCN contract through him being like very charismatic on camera through behind the barriers. And there's only so much room for that. Right. There's only yeah. so many GCN commentators. So like, I don't think we're going to see X pro cyclocross racer, Jump, it's a small that funnel. Like yeah, they're going to hit one the or two. Yeah, yeah there will be exactly. one or two. Um, but I think, yeah, there's definitely a, a wider spread. And I think Jay Powell, like being behind the barriers, first guy to do it was a big step. Um, and so we'll kind of see how the, the media entertainment side of the NCL kind of plays out because like right now their media entertainment stuff is not as strong as you would expect. Yes. It's not as strong as it needs to be for close they are. Given that that first race is going to be Miami in March, there needs yeah. to be way more out there about it. And it sounds like they're trying to like hammer out some, like they're going to be, I don't expect that we're going to be seeing metaverse stuff for this first race. It sounds like all of these things are going to be kind of like rolling launch. And they're talking yeah. about, you'll see different stuff from like the Miami race to the Denver race to the Atlanta race this year we're going to see different stuff. And then they said next year specifically, the goal is to double it in size. So at least two teams to four teams within the league. And then um, from four races to eight races, that's, that's the stated goal for next year. But I think even within the year, we're going to see like more features added as time goes on. So we wanted to talk like predictions and stuff. We're kind of getting, getting around the hour mark. Thanks everybody for, Tuning into this first one. Um, let's make some predictions and then close it out for this episode. Yeah. Um, we talked about sort of speculating on what teams other than the two, other than the Miami Disruptors and the, sorry, no. See, I already, it's not sticking with me. <laughs> I've got it pulled up on my screen and I am not. Uh, Miami Knights and Denver Disruptors. Yeah. If they were both alliteration, it would be easier for me they were disruptors miami <laughs> the miami meet i don't know who <laughs> i mean yeah i think like we think about teams because they're going to bring in eight teams that are not ncl teams to do this and you got to think about which teams are big enough to to sort of meet the ncl criteria as far as what the team has to be um and like who has a lot to gain by being a part of it i think you're going to see probably project echelon field a team. Um, I think Dark Horse, I think Automatic has a strong case to want to be a part of this. They're smaller, their budget's limited. I think if they are able to sort of go to this race, show out, have that big media presence, be a part of that big media presence, they have a lot to gain by being a part of it. Um, so on Automatic, I'm going to go ahead and like manifest this. Around this time last year, I had Davey Dawson from Automatic on the team. And we did kind of like a crit season preview, um, sort of how I learned to do all this stuff. But I would love to get Davey on this show um, so we can pick his brain on like what, what he thinks is going on with all of these different. We haven't even talked about the other series going on. There's other series happening yeah. this year. Maybe we'll do some uh, episodes down the road about what's going on with those. But yeah, I'd love to get Davey on here to talk about what Automatic's up to and what he's up to this year. Yeah, for, that'd be amazing. Um, Davey, like, bright guy, like, head in the peloton. So it'd be great to have his perspective as somebody who's in all of the races all the time and is, like, effective in all, all of those races, not just in there, you know? I'd love um, to hear his takes on how this um, point structure, he might, if they're going to race them, he might have a little bit more clarity on what the point structure is going to be, but yeah, uh, on how the point structure would um, maybe affect their tactics and how they're going to think about it. Because yeah. if there are points every lap, I mean, they've traditionally tried to just, they, they set out hard to get good position first five laps. Last year we would see them set a hard pace first five laps, kind of disappear in the middle. They would weld things together if it got too out of control and Legion wasn't doing it or Legion was in the move. But other than that, they were just sitting back for the sprint and 
you couldn't win one of these races that way unless yeah. the points are extremely heavily weighted to like a first lap cream and the, the end, end points. But I think that's what they're trying to get away from. So, yeah, I think the fear with the point structure in general is, is it going to favor a Legion style train where I like, I run the race for the whole time and I control the pace and I make it so hard that nobody's going to be able to attack over me. And I guess the fear is, is it just going to be that the whole time and it be the opposite of what the, the end goal is, which is to make it an exciting race every single lap. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm thinking. There's a decent chance that unless the points are weighted in a way that like concentrates the action, it, it could be a blessing if Legion doesn't do these races. Now I know I agree. the eyeballs are going to go wherever Legion is. Um, I mean, I can just look on my channels, the races I streamed last year, that Legion was in, especially the ones that they had won the previous year. So like peek behind the curtain. I mean, when I'm making a thumbnail for a race that hasn't happened already, I have to use something from last year. And when the finish line picture from last year is Justin posting up, those races always got more views than the others. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Legion, they've got everyone's attention, good or bad. They have the attention, uh, whether they, someone loves them or hates them. And I think you know, everyone's going to look wherever they go. So if they don't go to the NCL, it's going to be a detriment to the NCL's growth and attention on the front end. But it might be a boon to the quality of actual race. So it's like, I agree. Yeah, it's a weird sure. dichotomy where it could have less eyeballs on the racing, but be more fun to watch because you're not just watching that yeah. six deep Legion train set pace for an hour. And also, I'm going to throw this out there. If anyone from, from NCL is watching, you know, come talk to us we would love to have you on but i'm, I'm gonna just like wish cast some stuff right here so i hope the points are weighted in such a way that it makes sense that there's action rather than like every lap weighted the same every five laps is weighted much higher or something like that i also hope that the duration of the races is 90 minutes i think that's yeah. how you in, in races that are longer or hotter or and you can't control that stuff or more technical um and i hope the courses are interesting i hope we see some courses that have a hill in the course because if it's a longer race or a course with a hill we saw much 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 more interesting racing yeah. last year and i'm not saying i want all of the races to have a hill and i want all of the i do want all the races to be I mean, 90 minutes i think 90 minutes with a six person think, team yeah. 90 minutes is right i think 90 minutes for the fitness level of the riders a six a 45 to 60 minute race is it just straight up isn't long enough to make any of these guys or women tired? How so long 90 was, minutes? Um, uh, armed forces is that race is weird because it's done That's by like, like it's like a it's 100K. Like 100 K. Yeah, it's a hundred laps. Yeah, it's, so it's a hundred laps of a one K course. Yeah. So it's not time based, which is weird for a criterium because most are like it's an hour or whatever. But yeah. that's one of the races I can think of that they just like totally lost control of. Yeah. And I think you're going to oh. have to hit that over an hour and have something like a 180 degree return, a crazy hill, something that really breaks it up just by just having the feature there, like uh, yeah. just destroys the race on its own. We saw it at Crybaby Hill, Tulsa last year. Like Clever almost won that race. Um, yeah. Legion still pulled it out as they as they often do did a lot last year, but it was a lot more exciting to watch a race where like. Justin got dropped, and then you're like, who is Legion sprinting for? Uh, Clever was able to infiltrate their train because it got so chaotic. That's just way more like, fun to watch. like Snake Alley, right? Like a Snake Alley yeah, yeah. where there's a single feature that is so crazy. And think about how many viral clips over the past two, three years of Snake Alley where you see someone running into the back of somebody and it blows up because Chris Holly flipped over on off somebody's <laughs> rear right? Like yeah, that totally. sort of thing, like – Something like that that's going to make these more interesting than just a, a square, flat race. I'm throwing this out there. I want to do Snake Alley before I get slow, um, which is not going to be any time. I mean, I'm slow right now. I broke my leg, so this is the slowest I've been in 10 years probably. But I want to do Snake Alley before I'm like a washed-up master racer. Uh, also, going through my notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. There is one more element to their um, – it's not points, but their format that is interesting – 
specifically mentioned, there's going to be a qualifying round where you qualify for your grid position. So it's going to be gridded like cyclocross style where everyone has a call up, but instead of doing it cyclocross, it really matters where you're gridded. And we saw it begin to matter in the last couple of seasons, more in crit racing, where if Legion has that whole front row, which they normally did because they would be in the lead of the team competition and have guys who were in the top uh, of the individual points classification. So they were always getting a call up. If they have all their guys on the front row and they can just take charge from the first five laps, if you're toward the back, you're just stuck there because Legion's going to pin it at like 32 miles an hour. And when it's that fast, you just can't move up. Yeah. But it seems like the qualification system is going to be something like the street sprints they were doing at Athens Twilight a few years ago, where yeah. it's like uh, it's like a drag race. They said they're going to be the night before the race. So if it's like a Sunday race, they'll be Saturday night on the same course. But it sounds like it's going to be just one straight up drag race. And yeah, I don't know if it'll be tournament style, like brackets, or if it'll be just like go from here to there and whoever's fastest gets the best grid position. But that actually might make it where like your Sam Boardman's not that he's not fast, but he's not going to be the fastest guy over 200 meters. So it yeah. could change it up where some of those guys that are going to put it at 30 miles per hour and just lock it there are going to be gridded at the absolute back and moving up from 60 guys isn't, isn't a totally like impossible ask, but gonna make it a little harder and yeah. potentially more interesting. Like, I don't know if I want to watch that, but it yeah. could make for better racing. I think one thing that they could do that we used to do in collegiate cycling, where you get at the na actually at conference level and national championships, you get your team gets one rider on each row for a call up. So like Milligan gets one rider on the front row, Union College gets one rider on the front row, so on and so forth. And they do that second row, same thing, third row, same thing. Um, and they just call it out by school. And so hopefully what they do with the qualifiers, let's say. This just in, team, sorry. No. I can't use the Nick person's name, but I've got breaking news. I've been sent dates. Oh. Uh, NCL number one, April 8th, Miami. NCL number two, uh, May 14th, Atlanta. Then we got 813 Denver, 98 Washington, D.C. And then yeah. it looks like they're doubling back. I don't know what CRT is, but their race is listed as CRT number one, Miami, 99. CRT number two, New York City, 916. CRT number three, Chicago, 923, which that sounds like a Intelligentsia Cup, right? Chicago... It's kind of in the so, fall. Is that maybe the teams? That schedule? might be races that the team is doing. Yeah. So that's maybe like Intelligentsia, Harlem Skyscraper. There's also an Austin race. Okay. But there's not um, like a big Austin race that exists right now, is there? The other ones are Austin, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. All of those okay. are in October, which I don't love. Okay. Only... Only cyclocross during cyclocross season. <laughs> Everybody needs to like sure. step off. Cyclocross this year was the best racing of the year. If if oh, you 100%. haven't watched, yeah, I'm not not even going to get into cyclocross here, and we're not talking about European racing on this show. But cyclocross it's, is good this year. I feel like we're in a like it's really cool to be part of like a I feel like a generational era, right? Like people talk about this like the you know, the Le Mans era or the Merckx era. I feel like we're in the Wow Vanderpool, Pitcock era of something. And it's really cool to be part of that. This is something we can look back on 20, 30 years later. Like that was cool. That was special. Kate in the chat says that CRT is uh, the Williams brothers new thing. Oh, so that's actually cool. Okay. So maybe we'll have that's like true. two versions of this vying for supremacy, but it seems like, uh, it seems like NCL, I guess this is a good note to close it on. NCL is going to be first to market, but are they going to suffer because of that? Because it seems like maybe they don't have everything worked out. I'm not not hating. I wish them the best. I'm going to be watching it. We're going to be covering it. But 
you know, it seems a little bit undercooked based on the the videos we watched and the amount of information, yeah. just like how hard it was for us to dive down and piece together this information from all these different little sources. Yeah. And at the fear of that, I sounded a little too critical throughout the whole episode. I want to make it clear that like more bike racing in America is always better. Their mission of diversity and inclusion and equality across the board is something I 100% support. And I, I want to see it succeed, but I have critical brain. Like I initial, like I immediately try to find the hole in something, right? I but hope that I, that's I really what people... So this first episode is live on my YouTube channel. At some point in the future, this might have its own YouTube channel. It's also going to be on podcast apps. Um, but I hope that people who come to my YouTube channel are coming here for like objective analysis of things. And I always get hated on because I'm one of the only people on YouTube who's not either just like completely like I love the Williams brothers. They can do no wrong. Or I hate the Williams brothers and here's why they suck. Like, I'm given both sides and same thing with Zwift. Like I'm one of the only people that's making videos about Zwift. That's like, I enjoy using Zwift, but I wish that they would make a heads up points display. Like I'm one of the only people who hasn't drank the Kool-Aid. So I hope that's what people are coming here for is like, I'm going to try to, we're going to try to take like a balanced nuanced approach to this stuff. Uh, you're not going to hear us full throated, like endorse or, uh, or I don't know what the, opposite of that would be to cry i don't know right. hate on slander something dunk, dunk on whatever yeah. it is we're not just gonna dunk on something we're gonna try to uh talk about right. the pros and the cons anyway thanks everybody for watching this first episode the american peloton listening to it also hopefully some people will be listening uh check it out it should be up on podcast apps hopefully this weekend i don't know this is the first one so we're gonna figure out how that goes um comment on youtube let us know what we should be talking about what we should be doing what we should be covering but american racing if you want to follow it you know follow the channel look out for the next one i'm thinking we probably do these like bi-weekly monthly something like that yeah we'll see it could be every other week if like news really starts hitting or we have a ton of free time but yeah we'll that's see. not how it's been going recently <laughs> For sure. All right. I'm Jonathan Crane. Right. Ben Edwards. <laughs>